So, any David Bowie, Bowie fans out here? Yeah? yeah. You, can, you can share more, you know, more than that. Come on. It's David Bowie. There we go. It's downhill from there because my talk has nothing to do with David Bowie. Um, yeah, so there's this line in the song changes that, uh, that goes, turn and face the strange. Let me see if I can just, there we go. Um, and for me, what that line means, or what it evokes, I guess, is uh, seeing the procession of all your past selves kind of lined up, ranged towards you, kind of a hall of mirrors effect. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I mean, David Bowie represents, um, you know, experimentation and alienation and just acceptance and embracing, you know, uh, all these different identities. And so that song kind of represents that for me as well. Turn and Face the Strange is about, you know, all the things that make you uniquely you, right? Uh, the good, the bad, uh, the awkward, um, you know, the uncomfortable, the admirable, um, and the nerdy, and embracing it. So the story I'm going to tell you today, it's, uh, yeah, it's a story about two online fan communities, if you read the program. Uh, but it's also my personal story about turning to face the strange. My story starts in 1998. Uh, so you've got to cast your memories way back. 21 years. Uh, you know, I can see some pretty young faces out there. For, for those of you who weren't born then or may not remember, you're just going to have to use your imaginations. I'm going to try and paint you a word picture. Uh, 1998. All right, so I'm in my mid-30s, which means that I was 15 years old in 1998. Um, and I'll introduce you to 15-year-old Eric. 15-year-old uh, Eric, he was uh, you know, a little introverted, awkward, uh, desperately craving attention, never quite fitting in. Basically, you're, you're you know, average teenager, right? Um, he was a bookworm, uh, sci-fi nerd, right? Sci-fi fan. One of my favorite authors at the time was Orson Scott Card, uh, also author of uh, Ender's Game. Ender's Game was one of my uh, favorite books at the time. Anybody uh, read Ender's Game? Woo! Yeah, See, yeah, it's a great story. So it's the story of Ender Wigan, um, who goes to a training academy, battle school, in orbit around the Earth, where he uh, trains to become, uh, to fight a race of aliens called the Buggers. Okay, so Card landed on this formula that has proven wildly popular for young heroes since then in YA fiction, right? So you see the protagonists uh, like Harry Potter, uh, Katniss Everdeen, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they're all kind of the, the same model where it's these young adults, teenagers, that have to face all the same you know, mundane, everyday angst that we all go through. Uh, and yet managed to achieve these extraordinary things, right? So this really spoke to a uh, precocious, misunderstood, uh, young 15-year-old uh, Eric. There's another book that I read right around the same time by Card as well, called How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy. Anybody read this one? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so this is a very different book, No Nonsense Guide uh, to Getting your, Yourself Published. So 15-year-old Eric had goals. So uh, I should say Card had, and he still has, uh, a website um, called Hat Rack River. Um, and it wasn't long before I discovered that website, you know, in the shiny newness of the World Wide Web, circa 1998. Um, does anybody remember what it was like to surf the web? Yeah? Uh, for those of you who don't know, surf is what we used to call searching the internet. For me, uh, it was kind of like learning how to walk, okay? So you toddle through your search, uh, your keyword search, you know, you enter random words just to see what would come up because there was this feeling that, you know, there was just this wild mess of information out there just waiting to be discovered. And if you just found the right set of words, the right incantation, you could find something magical. Um, it felt like the Wild West, like you were blazing a frontier or at least it did to 15-year-old me. To give you a little bit of historical context, right? 1998, uh, Google was founded in September of 98. 
So Google, the premier search engine, synonymous with the internet today. Uh, Wikipedia, 2001, um, that's the site that aggregates most of our encyclopedic knowledge on the web. Social media, we got Facebook in 2005, Twitter in 2007, these are the sites that uh, allow us to curate our online personas. So, uh, you know, this is web 1.0, it's before all of this, right? So, it really was a time of experimentation, it was a time of newness for those of us exploring it, especially if you were a teenager. Anyway, so it was in my toddler fashion, right? You saw the cute photo of the baby, right? Yeah, in my toddler fashion that I discovered Hat Rack River. Oh, right, so what can I say about Hat Rack? Hat Rack, it's, it was kind of your you know, average website for uh, a science fiction author. It you know, promoted Orson Scott Card's books, his writing, um, and his projects. But it also had this section for writers groups, um, specifically uh, young writers groups. So it was a web forum. You can see as this was cutting edge technology. Some of you may remember uh, the bulletin board system. You can still find it on some backwaters of the internet. It's a uh, clean design. Anyway, uh, so there were threads where you could post your essays, your poetry, your stories, your book reviews, which was great because I'd never had a peer group. At that age, that was brand new to me. That was fantastic, where I could actually share my writing and get feedback. Uh, you know, from people my own age, that was, that was great. But the real exciting thing about this was the open discussions, and that's where the community really formed. That's where we bonded, right? This was a combination of a, you know, a schoolyard and a bar, if that makes sense. We could debate, you know, we could uh, carouse, we could flirt, you know, we could experiment, because this was a, a new medium, right? This was new to us, uh, and we were discovering ourselves. Um, and it felt like I'd found my people. You know, so as I said, a time of firsts for me. It was the first time I was sharing my writing with, uh, you know, someone that wasn't a resigned adult. Um, first time uh, debating fan theories. You know, so yeah, I was saying open discussions. Um, it was the place where we could fan out, uh, not just about Card and about Ender's Game, but about all the things that we were reading or watching or playing. Right. So, yeah, first. Uh, time I was a really able to debate fan theories, um, which I want to say I think I learned more on Hat Rack about thinking critically about what I was reading than in any English class uh, I've ever taken uh, at the time or since. Um, yeah, so what else? It was, uh, it was the first time that I felt that. Uh, you know, I, I really belonged, I mattered, and that was really empowering. So let's talk a little bit about what was happening at, you know, technically uh, at that time, right? And on Hatrack. So, um, there we go. Sociologist Irving Goffman um, wrote this book a long, long time ago. Uh, and he, he believed that uh, all human interaction uh, is a performance. You know, you present a face, uh, a certain aspect of yourself that you want uh, other people to see. All right, and now he was talking about face-to-face -face interactions, but the principle holds just as true with uh, online interactions. Now, the concept of affordance is uh, really helpful in understanding how the digital space changes how we interact. Performances are basically the elements within an environment that encourage us to use it in a certain way. So I've got this very basic illustration here of an affordance, right? If you take a cylinder uh, and you place it horizontally, well, you can, you can roll it, you can balance on it. If you place it vertically, uh, you can, um, what I'm guessing here is uh, fill it with water and boil an octopus. Uh, and so with the digital medium, that's kind of what you can do. It, it, has anybody seen the, the TV show MTV's Catfish? Yeah, so that's kind of what you can do on, online, right? Like you have a greater ability to edit yourself, to present yourself, um, you know, to curate a specific persona. Uh, with Hat Rack, we were doing that. We, it afforded us new ways of constructing our virtual selves. Um, but more than that, without doing a deep dive into adolescent psychology, it afforded us new ways of discovering ourselves, right? Um, we were able to kind of observe who we might want to be 
and try that out, test it out. Um, yeah, so that in a nutshell is how a, a group of young card fans and Ender Wigan wannabes uh, formed a, an online fan community. That's not where the story ends though. So as you can imagine, um, we were teenagers, we, it was the young writers group. We were rapidly aging out of this, our worldviews were expanding. Some of us were falling out of love with Orson Scott Card and his politics, which I won't get into. Um, and so, you know, there was, this, there was this rift that was forming. At the same time, we really cherished the community that we'd formed, you know, uh, and the relationships that we had. We didn't want to let it go. So that's how uh, Sleepless Whispers Forums was born. You know, we were so angsty. Uh, yeah, so what we did is we actually created our own space and our own community online. Uh, and at that point, we ceased to be defined as fans, you know, and we became uh, what, what we call a community of practice uh, based around this idea of writing, uh, debating, and creating, right? If you can read that last line there. What you're seeing here, this is actually the landing page for the forums, it still exists. Um, I wrote this on Angel Fire. Um, does anybody, do you remember what Angel Fire is? Yeah. yeah? Crazy, yeah, anyway. So we've had 20 years now to get comfortable with uh, you know, digital technologies and social media. I gave you the whole history a little while ago about, you know, Web 2.0 and what's happened since then. Um, so I, I am just trying to see here. Just a show of hands, how many people have their smartphones out here? Yeah, yeah. I know there's at least a couple of you tweeting right now. Um, how many of you have Facebook accounts? Show of hands, yeah. Uh, oh, so keep your hands up. Um, how many of you uh, check Facebook every day? Yeah, it's still, you know, most of you. Uh, and how many of you uh, use that uh, news feed or, you know, your feed as a regular source of information? You know, none of you want to admit it, that's fine. <laughs> um, so here's another question. How many of you take for granted the fact that, uh, you know, most of the time you can connect uh, and either send an email or uh, a text or search the internet. Okay, so yeah, most of you, oh, that's good. That could have backfired really badly on me. So I think that's the biggest change that's happened in the last 20 years, right, is that change in attitude. Now, 15-year-old Eric was on dial-up internet, okay? Uh, some of you might recall this sound Maybe, if it plays. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Beep. Boop, boop. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's probably better that it doesn't play because it might trigger some of you. You can bet that 15-year-old Eric uh, did not take his connection for granted. Um, and yet, uh, you know, I've got a permanently connected computer in my pocket today, right? So that has changed. Um, the internet isn't really the Wild West, if it ever was that, right? I mean, that's what we perceived it to be. Um, what it is now, maybe a better analogy, is uh, urban sprawl, right? It's, uh, it's constellations and clusters of data. Uh, you know, there's organization, but infinite complexity. And so the information landscape has changed as well. Our behavior towards it and towards technology has changed even more though, I would wait. And this is what I call post-digital information behavior. This is what I study as a PhD student. Um, post-digital information behavior, the ways we encounter, use, and share information when digital technologies are integrated into the fabric of our daily lives. Yeah, what do I mean by that? Integrated meaning that they're so commonplace uh, that they're invisible. We don't think about it, you know? You're not thinking about the fact that you're checking Facebook on your phone, you're just doing it. So that's post-digital information behavior. One way of studying post-digital information behavior 
um, that I employ is uh, studying online fan communities. I'm getting the five minute mark here, so I'm gonna have to speed up my speech. Uh, hopefully you can understand me. So, one online fan community that I look at is Fake Westeros. How many fans of Game of Thrones? You can just cheer, yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. Really? Nobody watches Game of Thrones in Australia. Good God, okay. All right, anyway, so Game of Thrones, uh, if you don't know, uh, is an HBO TV series that is wildly popular, has uh, been on the air for eight seasons, recently concluded um, with over 44 million viewers, uh, apparently only five in Australia. <laughs> and uh, Fake Westeros now is uh, a Twitter fan community. What they do is uh, they role play in character while live tweeting episodes of the TV show. Now, if you're interested, you can check out my research here. Um, this is something I've been working on pretty recently. One of the things I wanted to look at specifically was how they reacted to the end of the season, or the end of the series, I should say, and um, you know how they dealt with the conclusion of the series, uh, because you know the. the What's, what's happening here is we're getting the end of the story, the end of the fan object. So what happens to a fan community when the fan object goes away? You know, a lot of these uh, members of the community on Twitter, um, they have accounts that are named after characters in the show. Um, so would they just delete their accounts? You know, uh, would they just stop tweeting? Because technically, if there's no new episodes, is there a reason for them to live tweet? Uh, does anybody, as everybody knows what live tweeting is, right? Yeah, okay, I'm not gonna explain, that's fine. <laughs> um, to answer those questions, uh, you know, I've been looking at uh, the tweets from the last season. Here are just a couple that I think are representative. Um, and I think it answers the, the question somewhat. So I'll read Theon Greyjoy's here. He says, I've been thinking a lot about the show ending this week, and while I'm both excited, dreading it, and sort of not wanting to see it, I have realized that just because the show is going off the air doesn't mean the community is going anywhere. So clearly, uh, they don't want their community to end, right? Uh, these relationships matter. So this, I'm faced now with a really interesting question in my analysis, and that is, uh, at what point does a fan community cease uh, to be defined by the fan object? With Hat Rack and Sleepless, there was a clear uh, split, right? Um, we were fans of Orson Scott Card and of Ender's Game, um, right up until the point that we moved, you know, and at that point we ceased to be defined as uh, fans, right? Or at least of fans of Card. Um, there's a, a fan studies scholar named uh, Rebecca Williams who studies this specific thing called post-object fandom, which is, you know, what, what happens to fandoms or fan communities once the fan object ceases to produce new content. And she refers to this, co this kind of relationship or this kind of, you know, thing as fan-fan pure relationships. Meaning that our attachment is no longer to the fan object, right? In this case, uh, Orson Scott right? Uh, but to other fans, to each other, right? We became fans of each other. This is the same thing that's happening with Fake Westeros. Now, Fake Westeros, what they're going on to do now, it's really interesting. They've started a book club. Yeah, so they're reading uh, the books that the show is based on, and they're continuing that uh, on Twitter. Uh, the other thing that they're doing is, uh, or at least anticipating to do. I'm sure if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you're aware that there are spin-offs planned. So, fake Westeros is not going anywhere. But it's interesting how they've changed their dynamic, right? They also have this fan-fan pure relationship now. Um, they're fans of each other. So it's really, at the end of the day, what's interesting to me is a lot of my research is about exploring these changes that have happened you know, over the last two decades. Uh, that's really what the post and post-digital is all about. And yet, in comparing these two communities, what I've found is uh, one way that they've, you know, they're actually the same, something that hasn't changed. 
So that's it, uh, really. Um, you're probably wondering what happened to Sleepless, right? Uh, and it's a difficult question to answer. This is my turning to face the strange part, you know? Um, I don't really know. I know without much fanfare in 2006, the site was taken down. Uh, in 2006, at that point, uh, you know, I had moved on with my life. As I think many of us who, you know, grew up in the late 90s with Hat Rack um, and moved on to Sleepless, uh, had done as well, you know, university, work, family, these things happened. The social anchor um, that Sleepless represented was no longer there for us. Um, and I think maybe if there is a takeaway from my talk, uh, if there's something that I can give you, um, and hopefully it's not too depressing, is that change is inevitable, it's relentless. And, um, you know, the only thing we can do is embrace what's come before us and then turn and face the future. That's it. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.